word salvation there in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember I made the comment that sometimes new versions just totally water down that word salvation, and even, I think, multitude of church people do not really comprehend what all is involved in that one word, salvation. Most people, I think, think of salvation as just a fire escape. It just means that they're going to escape going to hell and they're going to go to heaven when they die. But you see, the word implies so much more, and as I mentioned in the last program, I certainly didn't have time because I can just about list 11, 12, 13 aspects of that word off the top of my head. And we're going to do that in uh, whatever it takes this afternoon, one program, two, three, it may even take four, just to define that one word that the Scripture uses, salvation. Well, we're going to start back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because salvation is, of course, based upon the gospel. And again, there is only one portion of Scripture that lays out the gospel so completely, so clearly, and yet so simply as 1 Corinthians 15, these first four verses. And we want to start with that then, that when Paul refers to the gospel, this is what he's referring to. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning of verse 1 again. We've read it more than once on the program. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, that is, positionally, by which also you are saved. See, nothing else. We're saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain, for Paul says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now, always remember, Paul is so adamant that he did not receive his gospel from the earthly ministry of Christ. He did not go back down to Jerusalem and check in with the twelve. But instead, he had his own private seminary training with the ascended Lord from heaven out there on the desert. And when he came away from that experience, of course, he begins these doctrines of grace. And I've also been so stringent in maintaining that our gospel has to come primarily from the writings of this apostle because he is revealing things that are revealed to him from the Lord after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, after his ascension, from where he is now seated, of course, at the Father's right hand. And so always keep that in mind. In fact, when Hebrews begins in chapter 1, I think it is, uh, no, in chapter, uh, chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, and leaving behind the principles of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, you don't just stay there. Those are elementary, and you don't stay in the elementary. You move on. I've always used the analogy of our, of our high school. In fact, I did in the class last night of our secular education. There's no way you can go into higher mathematics, mathematics if you haven't had second, third, and fourth grade arithmetic. I mean, it's just utterly impossible. But you don't stay in third and fourth grade arithmetic. You move on, see, building on it. You still can't do math without those, those simple uh, calculations. That, that's basic. Now, same way with the Scriptures, you see. We just keep moving on and moving on to further and further revelations. And so now when the Apostle Paul comes and he says that he is referring us to what he has received, well, we've got to sit up and take notice. All right, read on. Verse 3 again, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sin, and that he arose, that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. It was all back during the Old Testament. It was all prophesied. But it was never really explained. No one understood. But now, you see, it comes out so plain that when he died, he died for the sins of the world as full payment for the sin penalty. But he didn't just stay dead. He arose from the dead victorious over sin and Satan and death and hell and the whole bit. And because he lives, we live. So that's the gospel, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he arose again from the dead the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, while you're in Corinthians, I'd like to have you back up with me to chapter 1. <clears throat> 
Because, see, this is all Paul knows throughout all of his epistles. The preaching of what he calls my gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, and that's all he knows. All right, now in 1 Corinthians, then, chapter 1, if you'll come down to verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18, and he says, For the preaching of the cross, see that? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish the unsaved world. It's to them it's foolishness. doesn't mean anything. And we're going to be looking at that when we get a little further down in Romans chapter 1, at how the world treats this gospel. But to us who are saved, it, the gospel, the preaching of the cross, isn't just a ticket to heaven. It's what? It's the power of God. See? It's the power of God. Now, I can't emphasize that enough. Because, see, this flies in the face of reformers. This flies into the face of the good works people. I had a letter just yesterday almost screaming at me. I mean, it was so ridiculous, I didn't even bother to finish it. We have to earn our way into heaven. Oh, horrors. How can anyone even speak it or think it, let alone write it? There's nothing we can do but take what God has offered. And that's what we're going to be looking at in these next couple programs, at least, maybe even three. The power of God. Now you drop down a few verses in this same chapter, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Oh, they, they never could accept that he was who he said he was. To the Greeks, foolishness with all their high-level intellectual philosophy. Then they were to believe that this humble carpenter from Nazareth accomplished everything that Paul says he accomplished. Foolishness, see? But, verse 24 unto them who are called, that is, unto the true believer, unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the, and there's that word again, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see the difference? And see, that, that's a power that man can't even begin to touch. This is a power that is extraneous to anything human. And it's, as we're going to see, it's a power that has been exercised in our behalf that we can't explain except by faith. And that's what we're going to see when we get back to Romans 1 in 16 and 17. But before we go back there, I want to have you look at one more verse back here in Paul's other letters. Ephesians now. <clears throat> Ephesians. Galatians. Ephesians. Chapter 1. Drop down to... Oh, I guess we can start verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. And remember, Paul always writes to believers, and for the most part, Gentile believers. Now, we don't leave the Jew out because there is no difference, Paul says. There's no difference today between the Jew and the Greek so far as God's dealing in salvation is concerned. But the Ephesians, of course, were primarily Gentiles. And so he says to these Ephesian believers, and he'd just as well be writing it to us today, in whom you also trusted. Now that's in italics, so it's been added by the translators. But it could also be in whom you believed, in whom you've placed your faith. After, now watch this carefully, after you heard the word of truth, the what? The gospel, see? That's why I had to start with 1 Corinthians 15. After we heard the word of truth, the gospel, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, of your salvation, in whom also, after that you, what? Believed. Now what am I always saying? Just stop and think what a lot of people think should be in there besides believing. But it isn't. There's nothing else in here except believing. Then he says, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. My, what a loaded verse. You know, I've had people just almost drop their eye teeth as I read this verse. And they'll say, well, this flies in the face of everything that I've been taught from infancy. 
But see, there's nothing in here that can deal with an infant because an infant can't believe, an infant can't understand the gospel. This is something that only a, well, I was going to say mature, but at least someone old enough to understand right and wrong and that they're a sinner and need a salvation, understand the gospel, that Christ died for them. See that? And then after they've heard the gospel, they've believed it, then God moved in. We'll be looking at this later again. He seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. All right, one more verse before we go back to Romans, and that'll be first, Second Peter, honey. Second Peter, chapter 3. Another verse that we look at periodically because it's such a loaded verse. In all my reading, I very, very seldom see somebody use this verse. I think maybe once or twice in the last years and years of reading have I ever seen anybody refer to this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 15, where Peter, now remember, he's at the end of his ministry. He's just shortly before he's martyred. Paul's gospel has been on the scene now a good many years. And even though I think Paul, Peter had a hard time comprehending it at the beginning, he still hasn't really got the full knowledge of it, but at least enough to tell us this much, and account or understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation, see? That's the whole theme of this book. From the time that Man is created and falls in Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the end of this book. It's a book that is trying to bring about the salvation of a fallen human race. That's the whole theme of the book. And then in that regard, you can find Christ in one form or another on almost every page from cover to cover. Because this is God's main concern that the human race can find salvation. That's why he's done so much. All right, so the long-suffering and the patience of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath, or past tense, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What things? Salvation and all that attends it, as we're going to see it, as we're going to see in which are some things hard to be understood. Now get back into Peter's shoes, steeped in Judaism, steeped in legalism, steeped in temple worship, steeped a little further along in Christ's earthly ministry, steeped in all the covenant promises coming out of the Old Testament, and then to all of a sudden have to admit that God was not dealing anymore with the nation of Israel on the covenant promises, but instead he is out to bring salvation to the whole human race? Unthinkable! And so Peter has a hard time with it. I know he did. And even here, see, he's hedging just a little bit. In which also are things hard to be understood, even for a man like Peter. And which they that are unlearned, that is in the Scriptures, unlearned and unstable, they rest or they twist them as they do also the other scriptures. And what's their end result? Destruction. You know, I pointed out to the class last night how many times you can take a rank liberal or you can take somebody from maybe even a different religion altogether and they can speak of the Lord, they can speak of the Holy Spirit, it makes you think that they know what they're talking about and they know nothing, but they use the right terminology, see? They can use the right terminology. And that's what Peter means here, that they twist the Scriptures to their own destruction. All right, now then, let's go back to Romans chapter 1. In verse 16 again. Ah, we just, we can't... We can't begin to plumb some of these verses. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed, he writes, of the gospel 
of Christ. See that? That gospel that he referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 1, Ephesians 1, and various other places throughout his epistles. It's only one gospel, and that is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. He said, I'm not ashamed of that. For it, the gospel, and here's that word again, the power. For it is the power of God unto, and here's this word again, salvation. You see how many times they keep popping up? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that repents and is baptized and joins the church? Hardly. To everyone that does good? To everyone who keeps the commandments? No, it doesn't say any of that. To everyone that what? Believe it. Believe it. Now, why do I stress that from program to program? Keep your hand here in Romans and go back with me again to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Drop down to verse 6. We haven't looked at it for a long time. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And oh, if only humanity could understand this. But they, they ignore it. They walk it underfoot. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is, what? Impossible to please God. So what does God look for first and foremost? Faith. And when he doesn't see faith, there's nothing he can do. You go all the way back to Cain and Abel. And I've said it here. I imagine Cain was a, probably a better guy than Abel was. He probably had a more noble personality. He was probably a harder worker. Who knows? But what was his problem? No faith. He didn't believe what God said. Abel did. Esau and Jacob, I think there's another perfect example. Esau was probably a better man than Jacob so far as worldly view was concerned. But why couldn't God use Esau? No faith. He didn't believe a thing concerning what God had said. No faith. The nation of Israel. What was God's constant controversy with the nation? They wouldn't believe him. And all that he had done on their behalf and the visible manifestation of his power, yet they couldn't believe. And that was his controversy. He said, why did they not enter into their rest? Because of unbelief. What's the problem with the world tonight? Oh, it certainly isn't a lack of technology. It certainly isn't a lack of education and intelligence and the ability to read. What's the problem? They can't believe it when they read it. They can't believe it when they hear it. No faith. And when there's no faith, you cannot even get close to pleasing God. It's impossible. All right, so back to Romans chapter 1 once again. For the power of God, excuse me, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, that has what God is looking for, faith. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. Now, naturally, as Paul began his earthly ministries back there in the book of Acts, every place he went, where did he go first? The synagogue of the Jew. It was a logical place to start. Because after all, Israel had been the covenant people of God. They had been steeped in the word of God. They were the very writers of this book. And it was a logical place to start. But after about 30-some years, and they continue to reject it, then Paul comes to that final statement. He says, from henceforth we go to the Gentiles, because Israel as a nation was rejecting it. And so now for the last 1900 and some years, this precious gospel has been going primarily to the Gentile. But it's still open to a Jew, but he's going to have to come the same way we do, because again, Paul says over and over in the book of Romans, there is no difference. You know, I've told my classes, I don't think I've ever said this on television, but I've told my classes over and over. We know that from the very beginning of his dealing with the nation, called out Abram and Isaac and Jacob, the first thing he let them know, he was going to set them apart. They were going to be a sanctified, set-apart nation of people. You get into the Exodus coming out of Egypt, and at the fourth plague, the flies, God says, I'm going to put a division 
between my people, as he speaks to Pharaoh, and thy people. The first three plagues there wasn't. They all suffered the same. But he says, to prove my power and to prove my dealing with my covenant people, I'm going to put a division between Egypt and Goshen. And there'll be no flies in Goshen where Israel dwelt. And that was the beginning then of this great separation that God put between the Jew and the Gentile all the way up through the Old Testament dealt primarily, not exclusively, but primarily with those covenant people, the nation of Israel. But they were stiff-necked, as the scripture calls them. They were steeped in unbelief. And then finally, God had to let the temple be destroyed in 70 A.D. The nation was dispersed. The land was emptied of them. And this is another thing I can't understand our politicians today. Why can't they understand that Palestine has always been the homeland of the Jew? But they sure don't act like it, do they? They act as though the Jew is the imposter. He is the, uh, what was the term used after the Civil War days, the carpetbaggers and the squatters. That's the way they treat the Jew today. That's his homeland. You can't take that away. But God providentially uprooted them because of their unbelief, but at the same time, he uprooted them. What did he promise? I'm going to bring you back again. In my own time, I'm going to bring you back. All the Old Testament screams of that. And we should be able to wear, be aware of it, that indeed God is still going to deal with his national people of Israel. But all right, winding up the program now. No, we got a little bit left. Okay. For the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then verse 17. For therein, now you know I'm a stickler for language. What does the therein refer to? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. I think it refers to the word salvation, because that's the primary word in, in verse 16. So in that salvation, in that all-inclusive word, is the righteousness of God, what? Revealed. Unveiled, not man's righteousness, not Israel's righteousness, not some denomination's righteousness, but God's righteousness is revealed, how? From faith to faith. That's the only way God can deal with the human race, is on the basis of faith. And so then he concludes that statement, quoting from the Old Testament, I think it's from the book of Amos, the just shall what? Live by faith. You know, that's what Martin Luther finally came to the conclusion. And again, he was cloistered in a, in a Catholic monastery. And then all of a sudden, the light shone in. And what did Martin Luther conclude? The just shall live by faith. Not by works. Not by religion. Not by ritual. By faith. And so that became then his great theme of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. And I think Christianity has come close to losing it again. We're all wrapped up in works and materialism and do this and do that. What the program for this and a program for that. And we're losing the whole idea that the just shall live by faith. Now, those of you who have been hearing me teach over a period of time, you know I have one clear-cut definition for the word faith. What is it? Taking God at his word. That's all faith is. Taking God at his word. Well, in the minute or so we have left, let's go back and, and look at the Scripture's own definition of the word. Go back to Hebrews. Because I don't want anyone to ever think that I just pull this stuff out of the woodwork. Hebrews, chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Hebrews, chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now, faith is the substance. It's the very core. It's the epitome of things hoped for. It's the substance and the of evidence, things not seen, things that you can't touch, things that you can't see. There's only one way you can comprehend it, and that's how? By faith. What does God say about it? 
Verse 2, for by it the elders, that is the Old Testament saints, obtained a good report. Now verse 3, through faith, by taking God at his word, what God says, we're settled on it. That through faith we understand and know that the worlds, the universe, were framed by the word of God. See that? By the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. We're dealing with the invisible, and the only way we can comprehend the invisible is how? By faith. I've put four, and I think I've probably got 11 or 12 or 13 on my mind that I want to bring out, if not in this program, in succeeding ones. But the imputed righteousness of God is involved in the plan of salvation. In other words, the moment we believe, God, by an act of imputation, covered us or gave to our account His righteousness. None of ours. It's all of His. And we pick this up in Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> and let's start at verse 19. Romans 3, starting at verse 19. And he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now, who was under the law? The Jew, Israel, Judaism, temple worship. To those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty. Now, how far does the law reach out to? Everybody. Everybody. It was given to the Jew under it. He practiced it. It was his religion. It was his approach to God. But the law, as we understand the law, primarily the moral law, the Ten Commandments, didn't stop with the Jew. It reached out to every last human being, not to save, because it couldn't save a Jew either, but to condemn. See, and this is where people have totally misconstrued the role of the law. It was never intended to save a Jew. All it was intended to do was show him his guilt. See, that's all the law could do. My, I've, I've just almost screamed at my class people. The law was on cold tables of stone. Wasn't even anything you'd like to embrace and hold to your breast. And it just sat there in stark tables of stone. It could do nothing to help that person keep it. It could do nothing to keep somebody from stealing or committing adultery or anything else that it names. All it can do is condemn. Guilty, 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 see? But it didn't stop with just the Jew. It convicts the Gentile just as thoroughly as it does the Jew. All right, read on. Therefore, verse 20, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by doing what the law commanded, by doing good, by refraining from breaking the law, by doing what the law commanded, that's the deeds of the law. And there should no flesh be justified in his sight. That's legalism, see? The law can't do anything to justify a person. For by the law is the knowledge not of salvation, not of a way to heaven. It's what? The knowledge of sin. All it can do is condemn. You're guilty. And then Jesus took the law even further. He took it to the place where nobody can wiggle out from under it. And he said, even if you think it, you've broken it. All right. Read on to verse 21. But now, you know, I'm always stressing that three-letter word, but it's the flip side. Oh, under the law, all it could do was condemn. There wasn't anything man could do to keep the law except by virtue of the ritual and the sacrifices get back in a good relationship with God. But the law itself couldn't do it. All it could do was condemn him. But now, see, we're under a whole different set of circumstances. Christ has died. He's paid the sin debt. He's been buried. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended to the Father's right hand, interceding for us. But now, the righteousness of God. See, not of the human individual. But the righteousness of God without the law. See that? 
That just puts legalism out in the cold. But righteousness without the law is manifested. You know I'm always defining that word. That's put in the spotlight. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's what? The Old Testament. I remember years ago, a group of men approached me and uh, they wanted me to help them start a work up here in northeastern Oklahoma. And the first thing they told me as we began visiting about some of the things, they didn't want any Old Testament taught. I just closed up whatever I had and I said, then I'm going home. Because I've got nothing to teach if I can't use the Old Testament. You've got to use the whole. You use all the scriptures, Old Testament and New, because they all dovetail together. But he says it so plainly here that even though the law has nothing to do now with our salvation, with the imputing of righteousness from God to us, yet everything that you and I enjoy in this age of grace rests on what took place back there in the Old Testament. Just like I said in the last program, you can't go into higher mathematics until you've learned the simple part. All right, then verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is, or through the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that, what again? See that? Oh, people don't like that. They, they, they want to add something in there. They want to say, but we've got to do this. We've got to do that. We've got to do something. No, you don't. You believe. Now, when I talk about believing, I'm talking about really believing. I'm not talking about a head knowledge. I'm not talking about, well, yeah, I guess it all happened. No, I'm talking about when you get to the place that you can rest on these things and you can say, I believe it with all my heart. I have no doubt. I may not understand it, but I believe it. And that's the only way God can look at it. All right, come back to the text. This righteousness, then, that comes by the faith or through the faith of Jesus Christ unto all. We're not going to segment these people and put some in a higher category than others. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And again, when Paul says no difference, what he's referring to? Jew and Gentile. The Jew with all his legalism, with all of his background. He's on the same set of circumstances that we Gentiles are. All right, what does it mean to have imputed righteousness? Let's go all the way back to the first man that experienced it. Genesis chapter 3. The man who plunged the whole human race under the curse, made every one of us a sinner by birth, was also the first one to experience the imputed righteousness that God alone could impute. Now, remember that word imputed was a bookkeeping term in Paul's day, and it was like putting it to the account. That's what it, the word means. When something is imputed, it was put to the account. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Unto Adam also... And to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins? Now, of course, that implies the sacrificial animal. He had to kill an animal to get their skins. And that, of course, satisfied the requirement of a blood sacrifice, which we know that he demanded, as we'll see later in chapter 4 with Adam, uh, Abel. All right, so he kills the sacrificial animals, uses their skins to provide their clothing, to take the place of those fig leaves that were nothing. That wasn't God's idea at all. That was a human endeavor. But he kills the animals, skins them evidently, and puts the clothing upon Adam and Eve, and then clothed them. Now, too many people just read that, and they think, they think it was the physical clothing of those skins that is implied. No, it isn't. We're dealing with a spiritual phenomena here. And it is a restoration now of Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve back into a relationship with their creator. And it had to be the blood-bought way, and so that's why he had to kill the animals. That's the only way God can receive lost person, is by the shedding of blood. That's another one of the absolutes. Hebrews, chapter what? Eight, 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Never has been and never will be. You don't hear it much anymore, but uh, that doesn't take it away. So here, Adam and Eve now have an imputed righteousness that clothed them. Now you say, how do you get that? Well, we'll stay in the Old Testament and come on up to Isaiah. Isaiah 61, and it explains it so beautifully. That this is exactly what Adam and Eve experienced, even as Isaiah did. An imputed, covering, clothing of God's righteousness. Isaiah 61. Drop down to verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Oh, this is beautiful. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he, God, hath clothed me with the garments of what? Salvation. This same word. Salvation has always meant the same thing. Even in our secular world, we'll still use the word salvation. I was someone, as I've used the illustration over and over, someone is about to go bankrupt. Boy, they just can't dig themselves out of the hole. No way. But a rich uncle dies and leaves him a whole stash of money. What's the death of that uncle? Hey, it's the salvation of this old boy that's about to go broke. All of a sudden, he's made well. That's what salvation has always meant. Bringing somebody out of a destitute place. All right, Isaiah uses the same word. The garments of salvation. He hath, what's the next word? Covered me. See? What did Romans say? He has, got to go back and look at it. He has placed the righteousness of Christ unto all and upon all. See? Covers us. All right. Back to Isaiah. For he hath covered me with the robe of what? Righteousness. His righteousness, not ours. You and I can't look at each other and, and see our own righteousness. We, it's impossible. But when God looks at us, He doesn't see my righteousness. He doesn't see yours. Whose righteousness does He see? His own. The imputed righteousness that He has provided. You see how that just leaves us out of the picture altogether? I mean, there's nothing we can do for our salvation but believe it. We just have to keep our hands off. All right. So he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. You know, even the plainest of girls, she's always beautiful when? At her bride, at her wedding. Uh, we've been to a lot of weddings. And I've never yet seen a bride that wasn't beautiful. And I think that's why the scripture uses that analogy. When God looks at us, he sees something beautiful. And in ourselves, we're anything but. But he doesn't see us. He sees himself. All right, so now then, back to Romans chapter 3. Look at it again. The same thing happened to Adam that happened to Isaiah. It has happened to us if we've believed. And that is that he has covered us with an imputed righteousness, his righteousness, and none of our own. The scripture says our righteousness are what? Filthy. And you and I don't even want to think what a filthy rag was in the scriptural account. But whatever. That isn't what God sees. He sees his own righteousness. And upon all them that, and again, we enter into that by faith, by believing. Now, we'll come to the second one I've got up here. After we've got imputed righteousness as part of our salvation, we are justified. Justified, and that's in verse 24. Being justified freely, without a cause, without a cost, without a penny involved. Justified freely by his what? Grace. Now, most of you have already got my definition of justification in the flyleaf of your Bible or someplace. But you see, justification was a judicial act of God as the judge sitting on the bench. 
And that judicial act of God looked down upon you and I, the believing sinner, now entering into this great plan of salvation. He, he looked down upon us from his position on the bench. And after all, that's what Romans is really a picture of, is a courtroom scene. It's God building his case against humanity. We'll come to that later. But from that position on the bench, he looks down at helpless me and helpless you, and he says, because you've believed the gospel... I now declare you just as if you have never sinned. That's justification. A judicial act of God, whereby he declares the sinner who is guilty, guilty, guilty. And God says you're just as if you've never sinned. Oh, that's hard for people to swallow. We'll come to one of the others a little later, down to number four, forgiven. Why can God justify us? Because we're forgiven. How can he forgive us? Because we're justified. And it all rolls together, see? And it's all involved in that one word, salvation, which is prompted by the power of God. Nothing that man can do. All right, let's read on. Being justified freely, without a cause, by his grace, Oh, but here comes the next great terminology of the word salvation. What? Redemption. We've been redeemed. And what does it mean to be redeemed? We're bought. We've been bought with a price that's been paid by someone. Redemption still holds the same definition, even today. If you have hocked something and, and it's in the hock shop and all of a sudden you come along with enough bucks to go back and get it, what do you have to do? You have to redeem it. You have to buy it back. See, and that's the picture of the human race all through Scripture. Adam fell. God lost the human race. So what do you have to do? He has to redeem it. And the only way he could redeem it was to pay the price. And Peter, we won't take time to look at it, but Peter in his little epistle says, you haven't been redeemed with silver and gold, but with what? The precious blood of Christ. That's the price of redemption. You can't get by without it. If you don't like the blood, well, then don't expect to be redeemed because that's the way God has put it. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without recognizing the shed blood of Christ, there's no redemption. And we have to believe it. And listen, God isn't some Santa Claus up there that we can manipulate. A lot of people think he is. But no, he isn't. He's absolute. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's just. And it's going to be done his way or no way at all. And we can't manipulate him. And so he's laid down some of these basic truths. And I don't care if the liberals do throw it out. Let them. They're the ones that are going to suffer the loss. But we better hang on to the fundamentals. I have to remember gentleman was going to use our tapes in, uh, in his local church in another area of the country. And so uh, he showed it to his pastor. And all the pastor said, well, he's, he's sort of a fundamentalist, but he said, I guess that's all right. And go ahead and use them. Well, you bet you better be fundamental, because there are some things that have to be fundamental. You go into any profession, and we've got professional people here. If they digress away from the fundamentals of their profession, I don't care what it is, where are they going to end up? They're going to end up in court with a liability clause. It's just that simple. You have to stay with the fundamentals in whatever you're doing or you're in trouble. Same way with this book. We have to rest on these basic fundamentals. And one of them is, without faith you can't please God. The second one is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Those are fundamentals. And so now, we are redeemed. We're bought back with the precious blood of Christ. Well, let's look at a couple other verses so we don't just depend on one. Go back with me to uh, Colossians. Now, I think there's also one in Ephesians. I probably got it on the board. I? Yeah, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is what the book says. This isn't something I've dreamed up or some other theologian or something like that. The book says it. Ephesians chapter 1. 
Oh, I always have to wonder where to best jump in. Oh, I don't like to jump in on one verse. I like to get as many as we can, but I guess here we better. Because the period is at the end of verse 6. Now you come into verse 7. In whom, speaking of Christ, and remember in this little book of Ephesians, I think it's 90 sometimes that the prepositional phrase in whom or in him is used over and over. And so now it's in whom, in Christ, we have redemption. How? Through his blood. There is no other way. Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. See, I tied it in with justification a moment ago, but it's also tied in with redemption. They all, they all fit together. When we have the imputed righteousness, we're going to be justified, we're going to be justified, we're going to be redeemed, and if we're redeemed, we're forgiven. And that's only just the third of the list. I think I've got 12 or 13 of them. And they all fit together to fulfill that word, salvation. Now, I'm going to emphasize it again when we get to the end of it, but I might as well put it in here. Even of these four things I have on the board, can you take them and handle them? Can you lay it out on a table? Can you put it under a microscope? Can you analyze any of these things? No, not a one of them. They are all intangible. They are all invisible. So how do we know they happened? By faith. See? By faith we know that this has happened. That's the only way I know I'm forgiven. I haven't any great plaque on my wall at home from God or anybody else that says I'm forgiven. I don't have any decree from someone that says, hey, Les, you're justified, you're redeemed. No, I don't have any of that. Neither do you. What do we have? The promises of this book. It says it. And because the book says it, I know it has happened. I'll never forget years ago, a uh, lady to the Lord, and oh, she was so beside herself. She said, I've never seen these things before. But anyway, as, as we left dealing with her and her daughter, I told her, now tomorrow you'll probably have doubts. You'll probably think that this was all just an emotional thing, and after all, it doesn't amount to any. And I said, what you have to do, you come right back, and you look at some of these verses I've shown you tonight, and you just claim them. You just simply say out loud, now, God, this is what you said. This is what you've told me. This is what you've promised, and I believe it. And then miracle of miracles, you see, God increases that faith, and the more faith we have, the more we can believe it, and that's how we grow in grace and knowledge. All right, another one, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1. Verse 14. I was going to start at verse 12, but I got that for another event later on. <laughs> We're translated along with everything else. But Colossians 1, verse 14, still dealing with the aspect of redemption. In whom we have, past tense, it's an absolute, it's no ifs, ands, buts here, is there? This is it. In whom we have redemption. We've been bought back. How? Through his blood. Even, what? The forgiveness of sin. Do you see that? It's all tied together. And so we're a forgiven people. You know, I'm always warning folk, when we talk about believers coming before the judgment seat of Christ, I imagine a lot of believers still think that somehow they're going to have to be dealt with sin at the judgment seat of Christ. No, you won't. You'll never face your sin when you come up into glory. Because your sin has been judged already. It was judged there at the cross. It's under the blood. And we're going to come up only to see what we get for reward for how we've behaved as a believer. The judgment seat of Christ is never intended to determine your eternal destiny. My, if you haven't got it by that time, you never will have and you won't be there in the first place. But the judgment seat of Christ is only for the believer to determine his reward. Now, the great white throne judgment, yeah, that's something else. That's going to be for the lost of the ages, Cain and everybody else on up that has been rebellious and of no faith. Yeah, they're going to be at the great white throne judgment, but no believer will be there and no lost person will be at the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to be for the believers. 
And we're going to be there because we have been redeemed and we have been bought with a price. Well, let's see. Our next one, we've already touched on it somewhat. Maybe that's enough. We can just cover the fourth one right here. Forgiven. What does it mean to be forgiven? Well, it means that God has wiped the slate clean. He no longer has a controversy with you and I as a sin problem between us and him. It's done. Now, granted, in our Christian walk, we're going to fail. We're going to sin. We're going to fall. But that isn't what God is dealing with in salvation. That, that's something else. After we're a child of God, he's going to deal with our daily sins and our failures by the matter of confession. And he's going to recognize, yes, you are forgiven. All sin. And a lot of people can't swallow that. You mean what I commit tomorrow is already forgiven? That's what the scripture says. Does that give me license? Absolutely not. You know that. I have never advocated. You remember, I, I think I mentioned it in a couple of weeks ago in one of the programs, I just read a book by a great theologian out of London. And he said, if you really teach and preach the gospel of grace, as Paul did, if you really teach it the way the scripture lays it out, then you're going to be accused from time to time of teaching that people who are saved have license to sin. I mean, that's just part. part Paul said the same thing. I've been slanderously reported. But see, that's not what we have to understand. We have to understand that God's grace was so great that he forgave past, present, and future based on his grace, but that's not license. We still have to walk and work and live pleasing in his sight. And don't tell me you can go out and commit gross sin and still be pleasing in his sight. That's not scriptural. And so that's why I'm always qualifying. Yes, all these things have happened. God has done all this on my behalf. But that's not licensed. It's half hour. But I guess this time I better let our television folk know that all past programs are available on six-hour videotapes. And then volunteers have been, I don't know if the camera's going to be on this or not. Yeah, yes it is. So volunteers have been transcribing the six-hour tapes into a little book. So every six-hour tape has a corresponding book, and it's word for word. I keep trying to tell them, well, you know, correct some of my bad English, take out some of my extraneous words, and no, they won't do that. It wouldn't be me. So uh, it's just word for word right off the tape, and uh, it's not dressed up or anything. But uh, a lot of folk are enjoying these little books, and uh, I think a lot of eyes are being opened. We've gotten several letters where folk have expressed that they saw things they never, never saw before. So anyway, uh, you give us a call or write to us, and we'll get you the necessary information. All right, for those of you here in the studio, you're already turned to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to take the next item on all the things that God did on our behalf the moment we believe. Now, this isn't something that is progressively unfolded upon us. This all was an act of God instantaneously the moment we believe. See, and that's what makes this term salvation so fantastic, to think that God has done all of this without even checking me out to see if I'm worthy of it or anything like that. And so, as we come through these, just remember that these are all acts of God. No man can touch them. It was all done by Him and Him alone. So we're going to come down to our fifth one there, and that is that along with all the other things that God has done on our behalf, He has reckoned us as crucified with Christ. Now, crucifixion can only do one thing, and that is put to death. And so you and I, as believers now, have been, in the minds of God, put to death. Now, he had to, because this goes back to the very first law, if you want to call it that, that God gave the human race when he told Adam and Eve, The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Then he puts it in just a little slightly different way to, I think it's uh, Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And so that brings us to the place that if the law has determined that every human being is a sinner because we're sons of Adam, 
then it means that every human being has to die. We had to die. Now, I don't know if it's the right term or not, but I've often called it a loophole. You know what a loophole is. When the law says such and such, but you know smart lawyers can find a loophole and somehow get through it or around it, well, God has given us a tremendous loophole to that law of all laws, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And that loophole was, he died in our place. But we still have to experience that same death that he experienced in the person of Christ. And we call that substitution. All right, Romans 6, <clears throat> verse 6. Now, we'll be taking all of this later on again as we come on our way verse by verse. But just to show you that all of these things have been done in association with the word salvation, Paul now teaches here in Romans 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man, now again, a lot of people, a lot of church people don't know what the scripture is talking about when it calls us the old man. Well, it's the old Adam, that old Adamic nature that we're born with. Every son of Adam, every child of Adam is born with this Adamic nature that is bent to rebellion. You know, I've told my classes, and I think I've said it often enough on the program. You take that sweet, innocent, lovely, little newborn babe, how soon will he or she sin? Just as quick as they can just as quick as they can. They'll show it one way or another, even when they're in their total innocence. That little Adamic nature pops up and they show fits of anger. And then when they get a little older, they can lie like a trooper. Did you teach them to lie? No. Where's it come from? The old nature. And the same way that as they get a little older, they'll start using the bad language. Did you teach them? Probably not. But they know where to use it. Why? The old nature. And so we're all born with that old Adamic nature, and that nature has already sinned before we're even old enough to know what's what. And so what is the decree? It has to die. It has to die. God has demanded it. But here's the loophole. Here it is now, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified, it's put to death, it's died <clears throat> with him, that is, with Christ. That the body of sin, in other words, that the controlling factor of old Adam, might be destroyed or put out of commission. It has to have that power over us totally broken. And there again, no human endeavor can do that. Only the power of God can break the control of our old Adamic nature. We can't do it. Oh, to a degree... To a degree, you know, good parents, a godly home, we can teach kids a certain amount of inhibitions, and we can teach them, you know, not to do certain things and to do certain things, but still there comes a point in the best person's life when they're still going to give in to the control of old Adam. And there's only one way we can come out from under that control is Adam has to die. Adam has to be crucified. And that, of course, is exactly what the Scripture is talking about, that God now, in a substitutionary manner, died my death, he died your death in your place. Now, Paul makes that so plain in Galatians. Come back there with me a moment to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. A verse I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, know by heart or at least you know what it's saying. <coughs> Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified. See that? Just as plain as it can be. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In other words, he wasn't actually nailed to a Roman cross, but he was crucified, and he's alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, what do we call this? That's the new life. That's the new creation that he speaks of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are a new creation. Why? Why? 
because old Adam has been put to death. He's crucified. His power over our daily behavior has been broken. And he's dead. See? And that's what Paul experienced. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, day by day, week in and week out. See, God doesn't take us out when he saves us. He leaves us here. And we have to put up with all the things of this world. We have to put up with all of its pressures. We have to put up, yes, with old Adam that I think is still in force experientially. God reckons him dead. But Paul says here, the now life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. And I think a better word there would be by the faithfulness of Christ. Because... It's because of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. It's because of what Christ is to us day by day in our everyday experience that we're able to cope. And so it's through his faithfulness, not ours. And so I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and what gave himself for me. Now that's substitutionary. And it has to be an act of God. Now, the way I've usually put it over the months we've been teaching here on television is that when Christ hung on that cross and died, who else did God see in Christ? Every believer. God in his omnipotence saw every believer in Christ. And that's how we are reckoned then as crucified. I didn't make it up. The book says it. And so how do I know this is the way God looks at it? He said so. And so it's a matter of faith again. We can't comprehend these things except through the eyes of faith. That when he died, you and I died. When he laid in the tomb, for all practical purposes, God saw you and I in the tomb. Dead to the old life. Ready for what? Resurrection to the new. Now, I don't know if that's my next one on there. Uh, I haven't got it yet, but let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. This is a natural follow-up. Ephesians 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you, the apostle writes... I mean, this is written to every one of us. And you, he has, past tense, quickened. And what does quickened mean? Made alive. Why did he have to make us alive? Because he crucified us. He put old Adam to death on the cross. He reckoned us as in the tomb. But he couldn't leave us there. Any more than he could leave Christ in the tomb, our faith would be for nothing had he not risen from the dead. But he didn't leave us there either. He quickened us, see? He made us alive who were, what's the next word? Dead. See that? We who were dead in trespasses and sins, we were under old Adam. And we couldn't help ourselves. But, oh, God broke that power by crucifying the old Adam, by reckoning it as dead, and then he quickens us with resurrection power. And then you come down to verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. See how plain that all is? Do you believe it? You better because that's what the book says. And so he has quickened us together with Christ. And again, not by works, not by joining something, not by doing something, but how? By grace. The unmerited favor of God accomplished all these things. So it's by grace you are saved. And then verse 6, And he hath raised us up together, and hath made us sit together in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus, you don't feel like you're sitting in heaven tonight, do you? I don't either. But you know what? We are. 
We are, so far as God is concerned, we're already seated in the heavenlies, in the person of Christ. Oh, hey, this is beyond the average person's mentality. I know it is. But the book declares it, and we better believe it, that this is where God already sees us as together with Him in the heavenlies. And then, of course, verse 8 and 9, most of you know, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. Not of yourselves, not any work that you and I can do, because it's a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know how I've often put this? Wouldn't heaven be an awfully boring place if every believer you met, if every believer you met on those streets of gold would collar you and say, Hey, can I tell you what I did to get here? Hey, that'd be awful. That wouldn't be heaven. Be listening all the days of eternity to people tell you what they did to get there? No, that's not going to happen. Because, you see, every believer is only going to be able to claim the same thing. I'm here for one reason. The finished work of the cross. Faith plus nothing. See? And then we haven't got any room to boast. Even if you said, well, it's faith plus work for it. Uh-uh. Because then again, what are you going to be able to do? Boast. Then you can brag, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, yeah, you're saved by faith, but you've got to work to keep it. Well, it's the same thing. You're still going to be able to brag, look what all I did to keep and maintain my salvation. But we can't do that. We have to reckon that God has done everything. I have done nothing but simply appropriate it by faith. Oh, this is beyond comprehension. I know it is, but this is one. All right, now I want to bring you back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Well, again, I'm getting away from my list on the board, but I'm going down to number 7. We'll come back to number 6 in just a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Drop down to verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Now, like I told the class here, I think, in our last taping, studies like this aren't as exciting as the book of Revelation, and I know that. Oh, it's a lot easier to keep people's rapt attention when you can tell them about the mark of the beast and you can tell them about the coming of the Antichrist and Armageddon and all these things. Boy, you know, that, that's easy to keep people's attention. But see, this is the nitty-gritty of everyday Christian living. This is what every believer has to set his hooks into and to strengthen his faith and not be blown about with every wind of doctrine. This is, like I said a few weeks ago, this is fundamental. This is the basics. And it all began with what God did on our behalf. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, drives us on, because we thus judge or conclude that if one died for all, then we're all what? Dead in trespasses and sins. We're under the old Adam. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live to themselves. Remember what I said last program, grace is not license. Just because God has declared us forgiven, justified, redeemed, and reconciled, and all the rest of it, that doesn't mean we now live as we please. Oh, rather it brings on such a, a love requirement, such a debt for such love that we should want to do everything we can to please Him. All right, so we should not live unto themselves, but unto Him who died for them and rose again. What is that? The gospel, plain as day. Verse 16, Paul writes, Wherefore, henceforth, from this time on, know we no man after the flesh? Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know Him no more. What's he referring to? His earthly ministry. My, did you see any of this taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Not a word of it. Not a word. Why? Because this is all based on his death, burial, and resurrection, and that hadn't happened yet. 
They couldn't teach doctrine that was based on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so I can with a straight face tell people, you won't find this in the four Gospels. It's impossible. Now, I know men were justified in the Old Testament, but not on the same basis that you and I are under grace. And so Paul says, I don't even look back at Christ's earthly ministry. That isn't where our doctrines lie. Yea, he says, I did know Christ after the flesh. Well, I'm sure he did. He must have been about the same age. He was contemporary. And I'm sure that Saul of Tarsus, that religious Jew, was fretting and fuming every time somebody came to the temple area and told him what Jesus was doing. Oh, he knew all about him, even though he never had a personal contact, so far as we know from Scripture, but he knew all about him. And so he says, Yea, though I have known Christ after the flesh, that's his earthly ministry, yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. Why? Oh, because that earthly ministry was finished, he died, he was buried, he rose from the dead. Everything is now different. Everything. Now verse 17. This is where I wanted to bring you in. Therefore, because of his work of the cross, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, when old Adam dies... God again imparts to us a new divine nature. And that new nature, beloved, cannot sin. It's divine. It is placed there by an act of God. But we still have the old flesh. We still have the old Adam that is still capable of tripping us up. But so far as the new man is concerned, no, it can't sin. And then verse 18, all things are of God who hath, what's the word? Reconciled. Now we hear a lot about reconciliation lately. Broken families, broken homes. What's the best thing that can happen usually? To be reconciled. To be brought back together and into full fellowship. Well, it's a lot like redemption. Redemption and reconciliation are, are a lot alike because redemption, you've lost control of something. The only way you can gain control is to buy it back. Someone that has need of reconciliation has been separated by some gross disagreement or whatever. But to bring them back together is reconciliation. And this is what God wants to do with the whole human race. He's already reconciled. Read on. All things, verse 18, are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit, or that is to say, that God was in Christ reconciling the few, just the believers. No, who? The world. I maintain that when Christ died, he paid the sin debt for every human being that has ever lived. No one need ever wake up in their eternal doom and say, well, God didn't supply my need. Yes, he did. I gave an interesting little story to one of my classes the other night, and I haven't got time on the program to, to lay it out in detail, but a gentleman had been convicted of murder. And the whole community was up in arms because he was such a pious individual. They just couldn't imagine that he could be guilty of such a crime. But there was no doubt he had killed a man. And as he was waiting in death row to be hanged, the governor pardoned him. Wrote him the pardon. But in his anger and his rebellion, he tore up his pardon and stomped it on the floor, not realizing, of course, what it was. And so he went on to the gallows, and as they were about ready to open the trap door, they asked him if he had anything to say, and he says, yes. He said, tell the world I'm not dying for murdering a man. I'm dying because I rejected my pardon. But you see, that's exactly where every human being is. They've been pardoned. They've been reconciled. They've had everything done on their behalf that needed to be done, but they wouldn't believe it. 
And so they stomped it underfoot. And so they're going to go to their eternal doom not because of their sin. They're going because of their unbelief. They're rejecting the pardon. And that's what, as I said several weeks ago, see, that's what's going to make hell, if you want to call it that. And the lake of fire is, is different than hell, really. But for those who end up in the lake of fire, I think it's going to be that eternal regret that they're there because they rejected their pardon. They could have escaped it if they'd have just simply believed it, but they will not. They don't want to hear it. My, how many of my class people told me as they approach even some of their fellow church members, don't bother me. Leave me alone. I'm comfortable. Well, they may be comfortable now, but the day is coming and they won't be. But the pity of it is he has reconciled the world to himself. All right, read on. He's reconciled, verse 19, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. See that? I think too many people think that lost people are going to go out to their eternal doom because of their sin. Now, that's going to enter in, no doubt, because they're going to be judged at the great white throne according to the books, plural. But it isn't their sin that is condemning them. It's their what? Unbelief. Oh, let's look. Hebrews. I think i got a minute or two left. Go back to Hebrews, and, and this is such a graphic illustration. Hebrews chapter 3, where Paul is rehearsing the activity of Israel when they rejected the land of promise, Canaan, at Kadesh Barnea. When God had promised earlier, he says, I'll send hornets ahead of you to drive out the Canaanites. By the time you get ready to settle in, everybody will be moving out ahead of you. But what'd they do? They rejected it. They said, no, we can't take the land. We're like grasshoppers. The cities are walled. We can't defeat the Canaanites. No way. And so they wept all that night and all the next day because here it was in front of them, but they couldn't take it. And God said, I'll give it to you. All right. What it all boiled down to, come to the end of this chapter, chapter 3 of Hebrews, and come in at verse 15. Verse 15 of Hebrews 3, where I think Paul wrote Hebrews, he's rehearsing this event at Kadesh Barnea. And he says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in other words, when they turned out into the wilderness. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them who had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, which Canaan would have been, you know, but to them that committed adultery? But to them who worshiped the golden calf? That's what we would think. Because you want to remember just a few months earlier while Moses was up in the mount getting all of his instructions, the people came to Aaron and says, well, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Make us some gods that we can worship like the Egyptians had. And you know the story. And so Aaron took all their gold and their earrings and everything like that, and he made the golden calf. When Moses came down from the mountain, here they were in all their nakedness, in their seductive dancing. Gross immorality was taking place. And you know the story. But you see, several months later, as they get ready to move into Kadesh Barnea and turned around in unbelief and said, we can't take it, God didn't remind them of their immorality. What did God remind them of? Their unbelief. But before we move on into our study, we'd like to remind our television audience again that all past programs are available all the way back to Genesis 1-1. That's four and a half years worth now. And uh, we've also had most of them transcribed into little booklets. And uh, on the fly leaf of one of the little booklets we've got over there in front of the camera, we uh, have the television log of all the uh, stations where we are currently on the air from the various cities around the world and uh, now across the country. We're not around the world yet. But anyway, uh, they're not getting it on, so uh, 
we'll just, uh, there it comes, there it comes. Okay, so if you can read that anyway, we do have uh, a station in Denver, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Tulsa, of course, and uh, Indianapolis, Roanoke, Virginia, New Orleans, Louisiana, and then the satellite, which reaches from coast to coast, and a lot of the small Christian stations are picking it up off the satellite and are relaying it, and we appreciate that. That doesn't cost us anything. They, they do it as a public service, and we're getting a lot of response from those people. So anyway, we appreciate all the prayers and all the contributions of everyone that make this possible because, as I've said so often, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, I'm, I'm just one who loves to teach the book, and uh, the Lord is blessing it. My, I wish I could share our mail with more people, but uh, anyway, you continue to pray and uh, be a part of this ministry one way or another. All right, back to Colossians then and continue on on all the things that are part and parcel of our salvation. All the things that God did instantaneously the moment we believed, none of which we could do in the flesh. All had to be by an act of God and we appropriate it by faith. And remember what I said in the first program? that without faith, Hebrews chapter 11 says, it is impossible to please him. It has to be reckoned by faith. All right, now we'll come to the one I've got listed up there as number eight. <clears throat> We've been translated. Now, you and I didn't feel ourselves suddenly taking a trip. We didn't sense that all of a sudden we were in one place and now we're in another. But yet the scripture says that that's what has happened. It's a past tense. It's done. Colossians 1, let's start at verse 12, where Paul, as he is here praying on behalf of the Colossi believers, says he's been giving thanks to the Father, who hath made us meet or has prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who, speaking of God the Father, now remember, so God the Father has, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, you don't hear that much, do you? I can't remember ever hearing a sermon on being translated into the kingdom. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons about the kingdom. The kingdom is within you and all that. But listen, this is talking about a literal kingdom, spiritual as well as physical one day. Now when John the Baptist back there in the account of the gospel said, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what was he referring to? Well, the king was in their midst and where the king is, the kingdom was sure to come. But of course Israel rejected the king and the kingdom and uh, they crucified him. He was called back up into glory seated there now at the Father's right hand. But nothing with regard to his kingship and the kingdom has really changed. He's still the king of kings and lord of lords. I've always maintained he's not the king of the church. He's the head of the body. But nevertheless, the kingdom is still centered in the person of Christ. And so, at salvation, along with all these other things that God has done on our behalf, he has translated us from our darkness, spiritual darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son, which of course is in heaven. But that same kingdom is one day going to yet come and be established on the earth. And we're going to be there with it. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ over that kingdom of which we are now members by virtue of our salvation experience. So look at it again. It's a past tense. He has, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness. And again, you associate this with a, with a whole ball of wax, really. The power of darkness includes the power of Satan, the principalities and powers that are incumbent upon the human race. But it's also that old Adam that we talked about a program or two ago and all of his power. All of that has been broken away 
and we are now translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We were just talking at break, Sandy and I. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The world out there thinks that they are in freedom. And they feel sorry for us because they think we're bound up with our do's and our don'ts and our inhibitions and so forth. But listen, it's the other way around. The world is out there under the chains of darkness, of rebellion, of satanic power, and we have been set free. We have the best exercise of free will of anybody in this world. And that's why we constantly say that our freedom is not licensed because our freedom is so God-given that we don't want to do the things that license would, of course, permit. <clears throat> so I never want to be misunderstood that just because we have such freedom, we have that complete exercise now, the free will, that the unsaved person has nothing of. He's bound. He's under chains. We're free. And we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, to back that up a little bit, back up a couple pages to Philippians. Next little book to the left. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Oh, just another backup to say the same thing. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation, King James, newer translations have what? Citizenship. For our citizenship is where? In heaven. See, now you don't feel like you're a citizen of heaven, do you? You're pretty much on terra firma. But by faith, you and I know that we're already citizens of heaven, because that's what the book says. And so our citizenship is in heaven, from whence, from that same heaven, that we look for the Savior, at His coming for us, at the rapture. I was just reminded the other day that I haven't talked about the rapture in this program for almost 20 or 30 weeks. So I guess I'm going to have to again one of these days. Maybe our next taping. We'll take a, a good, solid look at this next event on God's calendar. We don't know when it'll be, but we certainly feel like it can't be too far into the future. And that is that soon appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to meet us in the air. And we know that, again, that's something that we take by faith because the Word declares it. But anyway, we have been translated now out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of Satan and the curse and the old Adam, and we are now a member of the kingdom, which, of course, is now located in glory. We're waiting for it to still come, and when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, we, of course, will be in it. All right, now another one that's probably a little harder to swallow is in chapter 8 of Romans again. And that is that we've been glorified. Now, this probably isn't quite as definitive as some of these other things, but nevertheless, uh, I want to show you the verse <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8. And we'll begin with verse 14. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. And I have to remind my listeners, Paul always writes to the believer... And so this is for every true child of God, not just for the few, not for the elite, but for everyone. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are already, not going to be, but they are the sons of God or the children of God. Verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, there's another. I've got to digress for a second. The word adoption here doesn't mean what we normally think of, of taking a child from some other union and bringing it in and making it legally ours. <clears throat> the word adoption <clears throat> at the time of Paul meant that they would take a child who had been tutored by tutors under schoolmasters and at an appointed age they would make him a full heir with the father. In other words, if the father had a business and this young lad was tutored, 
when he had finished his tutoring and they felt that he was now ready, they would go through the rite of adoption whereby the father would declare that child a full heir in the business. I always like to think of the first time we were in Israel years ago, and uh, my wife is pretty good at bartering, and we were in one of those shops, and uh, she said all the way along, she said, I'm only going to shop one time. I don't want to be picking up bits and pieces. She said, I want to go in and buy what I want and be over with it. <clears throat> so we went in this one beautiful shop, and there was a little lad behind the counter. He couldn't have been over, what, 10, 10 11 years old, honey? And the father was sitting in a back ante room at the desk, Boy, she was bartering with that kid. She was bringing the price down, bringing it down, bringing it down, bringing it down. And finally, you know, and I thought, man, the guy's losing money with this kid. He closed the deal, and she paid him. And so I walked back to the gentleman, and I said, do you speak English? Oh, yeah. And so I asked him. I said, can you let that little kid transact business like that? He says, he's never lost me a dime yet. You know Why? He had been so tutored and so trained that that father had absolute trust in his negotiating. Well, that's what it meant to be adopted, to be put in a place of full responsibility. Now, you see, that's what God has done with every believer. I haven't even put that in my list. See, this is free for nothing. <laughs> we have been placed as the full child, a joint heir, as it says here, what responsibility? That's a responsibility, just like that kid. It was his responsibility that she not take him down too far. He had to still show a profit. And it's the same way with us in the Lord's service. He has placed us in places of responsibility. And as I said a couple, three weeks ago, or last taping, I think, to handle this book, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a women's group leader, or whether you're a missionary or a pastor or whatever, to handle this book is an awesome responsibility. Don't you ever take it lightly. Because these things are eternal, see? And we have to look at it this way. But here, Paul says we've been placed now then through the, through the spirit of adoption as a complete heir with the Father. And then, verse 16, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that... We will be, uh-uh, what? Are, present tense. We are the children of God. Then what? Heirs. And if we're heirs of God, then we're joint heirs with Christ. I see the average believer doesn't have a slightest hint of this. That when we became a child of God at the moment of our salvation, the moment we believed, God declared us a full son of the Father. A joint heir with Christ. I can't comprehend that. It's beyond me. Because you know what joint heirship means, if I understand the law? For a husband and wife to be joint heirs, what's his is hers and vice versa. They're co-equal. Do you realize where that puts us? That tells me that one day everything that is Christ is going to be ours. That's awesome. But the book says it. Everything that's his is going to be ours. Oh, let me show you another verse. Oh, we've had a lot of fun in some of our other classes during the week. Come over to Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 1. Now, I'm totally digressing. I didn't intend to do this, but this is too good to pass up. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> oh, my. Verse 19. I'll probably run out of time now, but uh, this is too good. Ephesians 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who, what again? Believe, see that? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under 
his feet, that is, under the Lord's feet, and hath given him to be the head over all things to the church. And then verse 23. The church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, I don't remember what class. I think it was in, uh, in Wilberton Tuesday night. This word fullness could also have been translated the complement. Not with an I, with an E. The body of Christ, of which you and I are members, is the complement of Christ. Now, what's the complement? Well, go all the way back to Genesis. Have I got time, Sharon? I, what do we got left? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, back to Genesis. Chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve. They haven't sinned yet. That's in chapter 3. But here's Adam and Eve before the fall. In fact, Eve isn't even on the scene. Just Adam. Eve is still in Adam. But Adam is here and all the animals are paired up. And uh, when we were teaching Genesis, we made a point of this. And, uh, oh my, let's start at verse 16 again. Genesis 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will, future tense, make him a helpmeet. And so out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. What's the word helpmeet in the Hebrew? Compliment. He was without his compliment. What were we talking about? Eve. She's not there yet. And I always like to make this analogy. <clears throat> Here come all these pairs of beasts, animals, and birds, and everything else. All by pairs. And Adam named them. But I'm sure it struck him, why do all of these animals have their mate, male and female? And I'm alone. See, and that's what God recognized. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. As he'd already recognized in the animal kingdom, they had their pairs, but Adam was still alone. And so he creates Eve from out of Adam, and she now becomes then his complement. What does that mean? He's completed. See, he's completed. Now, come back again. I hope you hand, still kept your hand in Ephesians. This, too, is wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles. That even the Lord Jesus, the crowning creator, God of the universe, has such a love for his blood-bought church, his body, that the scripture says he doesn't even consider himself complete until he has us in his presence. Now, if that isn't mind-boggling, I'd like to know what is. But that's what the scripture says. Come back again. Verse 22 and 23, And so God has put all things under Christ's feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the complement, the completing of him who filleth, all in all. Now that's something. See, that, that's, that's the joint airship. That's why what he has, we're going to one day have. How do I know? By faith. The book says it. Again, I, I don't know of any other way I could explain it. We can't just lay these things out and say, well, that's where it is. But the book says so. And so it's on that basis that 
we believe. All right, I got a couple left yet. We got to be sure and hit these. Come on back to 1 Corinthians now, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, drop down to verse 12 and 13. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. And again, remember, Paul is writing to a Gentile congregation primarily. I'm sure there were Jewish believers in here. But to these believers at Corinth, he says, For as the body, the human body, is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now here it comes. This is another act of God that you and I never felt. We had no outside manifestation of it. The only way we know that it happened is because the book says it did. For by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, are we all, every believer, not just the most elite, not the most spiritual. That's the man's idea. But God says by one Spirit we have all been baptized into one body, that church universal that body that includes the believers from whatever corner of the globe they may be. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into or partake of one spirit. Now you see what that means? That by the invisible act of the Holy Spirit, he placed every believer the moment they believe, the moment they're saved, they're placed into this body of Christ, which will one day be his bride. Now again, remember, we're not talking in terms of sexuality. We're talking in terms of position. And so the bride of Christ will be that consortium of all the believers of the church age who have been placed into the body by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm always emphasizing to my classes here in Oklahoma, I dare say, without judging, without looking at any membership list of any group at all, I would just guess off the top of my hat that probably 50% of every church role is unsaved people. I'm just guessing. Some churches more, some less. Because, you see, every church takes in people for members that are not saved. There's no way they can screen them because we can't look on the heart. We can't determine who's saved and who's lost. That's that's a that's a area that only God can look into. But into the body of Christ there are no unbelievers. No unsaved person ever is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And so that becomes then a criteria as well, not only by having our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but have we been baptized into this body by an act of the Holy Spirit? That guarantees your eternal destiny. And that won't happen until you've believed the gospel and all these attendant aspects of salvation have been done at the same time. Hey, listen, how can you doubt how can you doubt if you've been forgiven and redeemed and justified? And I haven't even put in sanctified. I passed that one. And you've been translated. You've been reconciled. You've been glorified. What else? And then you've got doubts. How can you? And every one of these we take by faith. God has said it. We believe it. And we rest on it. Now, I know the old devil likes to come along and poo-poo the whole idea, but we come right back, and what do we do? You claim it. You claim them. See? Here it is. God, you've said it. I believe it. And we hold him to it. God wants us to. He wants us to say, now, God, you've promised. 
And that's the whole idea of taking this as the Word of God. See, if this isn't the Word of God, hey, then I'd have been better off staying home. I could have been punching cattle all day long. Beautiful day for that. But you see, this is more important because this book is true. This book is the Word of God. And this is what we have to rest on. All right, I got one more left and I got one minute. Stay in 1 Corinthians and turn over to chapter 3. And I guess this is a good place to end this taping. Next taping, we're going to go on into the wrath of God. That's not going to be as pretty. That's going to be the other side of the coin as we go on into chapter 1 and verse 18. But here in Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know you not, Paul writes to believers, don't you know that you are the temple of God, the dwelling place of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth where? In you. And that again is a Pauline aspect that is never mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. <laughs> 